Good afternoon, I'm Jane <coughs> Pope, um, legislative aide to William Bowie, District 62, State Representative. Good afternoon, Mr. Crane. Thank you for coming. It's my pleasure to be here. So we're going to start the question by asking you, did you support the city being created the first time and the second time? And if you did, why? And if not, why? Well, thank you for the question. Absolutely. I, I not only supported it back in 2006, it was Benny Crane who was the chairman of the organization that raised the money uh, to fight annexation that, came, that was launched against us in 2006 and 2007. We raised money to pay for attorneys and we, uh, I led the charge to get people out to the poll to vote then. And when we started this process again in 2002, and 12, it was Benny Crane that went to represent Roger Bruce uh, to get his buy-in to help us in getting the enabling legislation uh, so that we can get back to the poll. Now, why I did that? Because I knew that after Sandy Springs, Johns Creek, and Milton became cities, we were in harm's way. And number one, and number two, we were forfeiting millions of dollars in local option sales tax dollars. And because we were, we were not able to provide adequate level of services for the citizens of unincorporated South Fulton. It was true in 2006 and in 2007 when we went to the poll and when uh, we lost that, it was true then and it's true now up, up until November the 8th of 2016 that we were forfeiting over $20 million a year. So since 2006, we forfeited over $200 million in local option sales tax dollars while at the same time, our millage rate increased five out of seven years in a row. So I knew then, I know now, that it was the right thing to do then to create a new city of South Fulton, and it's the right thing now. So I'm just happy that I was involved. I was the chief architect behind it. It was Benny Crane that went to Georgia State and signed a personal guarantee for the feasibility study. I literally wrote the legislation, delivered it to Representative Roger Bruce, and it was, in my, it was that legislation that he was able to get through the House that ultimately went over to the Senate. So I'm happy that I was involved in that process. Okay, let me, because um, I just want to correct a few things, you know, because the general public is going to be seeing this, this right. tape. The legislation was actually written by legislative council. The legislation that we have uh, that was passed is actually now the city charter. And uh, so that was written by legal counsel. And uh, so now I will concede that you did come to me to talk about uh, creating this city, but the legislation itself was written by the general counsel. So I just want to be make sure that people understand that piece of it. The question I have is about vision. What do you feel, what, what is your vision for the, the new city? Um, think four years from now. We are in a meeting, we're having, uh, you, you completed your first term in office and you are now the, um, the mayor and you're giving the state of the city address. What are you telling us you achieved and you accomplished in that period of time? That's a, that's a deep question, and that gets down to the granular level. It's a great question. During the first two years of a Ben and Crane administration, my primary focus is going to have to be to create a community that we have clean streets and a safe community. During the first two years, I want to get stand up a police department that has 200 police officers so that we can get community policing back. By the end of that fourth year, we're going to have a fully built out police department with 250 police, which will meet the national standard at two police officers per 1,000 citizens. So in that state of the city address, I would tell the citizens of this new city of South Fulton, which will be four years old then, that the state of our city is good. It is now clean, it's now safe, and we have a robust economic development plan, which is going to bring quality development to our new city, a, de a quality development that that's unparalleled when you consider where we started, when, when economic development was almost non-existent. So the state of our city is good. Okay. How does the economic development look? 
well, hey, this is the way it looked. We're going to uh, go all over this country, and we may do some uh, research even around the world, taking best practices from, from every city near and far to see what they're doing, and we're going to do a Me Too revolution. In other words, we're going to take best practices from around the country. So what that means is going to, if, if, if it means from an economic development standpoint of view, we'll have a best-in-class economic development team, first of all. We have tons of opportunity all over this city where we're going to attract uh, not just industrial and warehouse jobs, those are low-paying jobs, and they're the workforce that can fill that, but there are, there are opportunities for we can have high-paying jobs, Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 100 companies. I want to attract those companies to what I call beachfront property, and what I mean by that is we are right at the footstep, at the back door of the world's busiest airport. So we're going to create some huge opportunities right here in our new city because it's going to be a national, if not an international city. That's why you'll hear me say it's going to be best in class in the economic development department. So prior to writing that best in class chapter, there's this transitional period. Uh -huh. You go from the county to uh, the new city of South Florida. <clears throat> Can you share with us, um, Benny, what are three or four things during this you, for your transition plan, what are three or four critical things you need to accomplish during this transition from the county to the city hood? Right off the bat, I would have to get my city council to approve with me uh, opportunity to, to do a national search, to get a best in class city manager. We have to be sure that we have the most capable person available, whether they are among us now or whether they come from some city far or near to make sure that they have the experience and the past performance in leading a city of this size and this composition. So we got to make sure we do that. Then we got to make sure we stand up a human resources department and a strong finance department. Those are key critical areas that we got to hit the ground running day one. So insofar as the transition, the county will continue to provide the same level of services that, we'll, that we're getting now, which are woefully underserved. So that's what we'll have. But as we take over those services and stand up each department, whether that's parks and rec, zoning, economic development, code enforcement, we're going to make sure that we have key people in place to lead those departments. They may already be there. But we want to make sure that we are getting the best available talent. And we have a broad and vast talent pool, but we're going to make sure that we transition, not business as usual. Some people want to have us to transition and have what we have now to have that then. That's not a Benny, Benny Crane administration. My goal is to have us in a place that we've never been before. So you have to do things differently. So our transition, we will stand up quality departments led by quality people with quality employees. So it's going to be a best-in-class organization from top to bottom. What makes you qualify to be able to attract businesses uh, as Fortune 500 companies? And what would be your strong suit to be able to get a city council other individuals to go along with what you see as the future for the city? That's a great question. I've spent the last 40 years in leadership, in private business, in, uh, in the public sector, uh, insofar as uh, nonprofits. I've been a, a county appointed uh, person at a very, very high level. So I bring to the table a huge amount of leadership skills. That's what I have done for nearly 40 years in leading, in leading people. Now, let me be very clear. This is not something that's going to be a heavy lift just by Benny Crane. I'm going to count on the department heads, the city attorney, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, city administrators. All of us will work collab collaboratively together to make sure we have the right people in place that will go out and attract. Benny Crane is a leader. He's a team builder. So I'm going to use my leadership skills to, to facilitate that. So my, my core strength is leading and assembling teams, being a bridge, a bridge over troubled waters. So that's what I will bring to the table, my leadership characteristics. You mentioned um, zoning and bringing businesses in to the community. How are you going to deal with the commercial zoning? Because we have issues with warehouses being built in the citizens' backyard 
How are you going to deal with the commercial zoning issues that we now have in South Florida? Well, what we have is what we have. But moving forward, we have to make sure we have transitional buffers. And what that means is where you have industrial, you step it down. After you have the industrial piece, then you go to multi-use you know, a multifamily. From there, you step down to, to, let's say, duplexes. Then you step down to single family. We have not had that type of aggressive uh, visionary to have transition. We went from single family to industrial. That's not how city planners would do that today. Nowhere on this planet, if they're worth their salt, and many of them are, that's not how you plan transitional buffers. We got to make sure that we do it correctly so that you don't have industrial and residential being built next door to each other. But what we have is what we have. We can't unbuild what we've built. Okay, you said city, I'm sorry, city planners. The, the man that, um, that, that took up most of South Fulton Parkway and put in most of all of those warehouses, was a planner. So could you give me somebody else that could help take care of that? Because all this mismanagement is now located in the city, in another city, and we can't do nothing about it. That's true. So give me an idea of what you could do to, to get somebody else other than the person you said it wasn't worth their salt, because apparently they weren't, and that's where we're having a lot of problems at. So what would you do to correct it? Not, you can't really, well, to stop that, right. to, to work with the other cities to make sure that no more of that happens. And the other piece is down in Palmetto where the old airport, South Fulton Airport is, they're talking about developing that. Will you work with them uh, to make sure that it's part of the plan that the zoning in our city wants? Well, you're absolutely right, first of all. And I did say that all city planners are not created equal. And unfortunately, the caretaker who were in that city that you were referring to that took up most of the South Fulton Parkway was a city planner. But unfortunately, that wasn't one of the kind of city managers that I'm talking about that's going to make our city great. And absolutely, yes, we have to work collaboratively with, uh, from a regional perspective. You have several cities in South Fulton. You have a county and cities to our west in Douglas County and to our south in Fayette County. You have to the east, you have Clayton County. We have to work together because with South Fulton, the city of South Fulton being the largest city in our region, if you call South of I-20 region, we have to make sure we have key people in place. That's why I'll keep, driving this nail home that we have to get best in class people who have a history and past performance of doing it right. We just can't keep on doing the same things and expecting different results. That's why national searches are going to be done on multiple levels to make sure we get it right. We get one chance to get this right. The things that are out there on the ground now, we can't change them. But what we can do in working with that city who now pretty much controls the parkway we have to work with them in a comprehensive way to make sure we step down the transition from the parkway, the industrial piece, down to Cedar Grove where you have residential. So we have to be smart. The things that are there, again, we can't unring the bell, but we do have to be smart in future development to make sure it's smart growth and it is sustainable. I want to ask you, you know, earlier you made reference, and I guess I'm just looking for, for clarity, just to make sure that as people look at what we're doing there right now with the campaign to bring all of this in place was based on the fact that we have been a city without a charter for 10 plus years that's right which means that we have had employees that were working on our behalf that worked for the county but they were doing city services the question is around how we transition, are we going to transition those employees over to the new city? Are we going to make everybody reapply for their jobs? I mean, what, what is your thought and how we capitalize, if, if, if that's the proper word, on the fact that we've been operating as a city without a charter? I mean, is the question clear? Well, I'm, I'm very clear on that yeah. question. Well. Certainly, those employees have been, been providing the city services to the <clears throat> unincorporated community. But the county cannot dump their employees on a new employer. That's like Coca-Cola just giving all their, their employees to Pepsi-Cola. They can't do that. If you want to work for the new city of South Fulton, all of those county employees who have an interest, 
they will apply for and they'll be appropriately vetted by a uh, best in class human resources department. So that's the first thing. It's not our decision of whether we're going to bring them on. That's their decision first. However, if they want to come, they'll be vet it appropriately and we're going to, and, and that's what's so beautiful about this we have a ready pool of shovel ready em, uh, employees who are ready to come to work i look forward to going through that process that's why one of the first departments that have been in crane's administration will stand up is human resources so that we can then set our priorities which departments are we going to stand up first then we'll open up um, that opportunity to have those people come and apply, be appropriately vetted, and, and we'll get them on board and stand that department up. So I look forward to those people coming to work for us. However, some of those people will probably find opportunities in the county you know, to work in other departments. That'll be a decision that they make, but our doors are gonna be open to those people first. So in this climate, uh, present climate of public safety and sometimes the lack thereof, how do you plan to deal with that? Well, we have a huge problem right now in the public sector, uh, public safety sector. We are understaffed with the police department. We're understaffed in the fire department. And in a Benny Crane's administration, I'm going to set out to hire enough police officers in the first two years to bring us up to 200 police officers so that we can have community policing again. I want to implement a policy where police officers will be able to take their vehicles home because that puts constant police visibility in the community. When you, if, if, so if a young or not so young offender or criminal were to be going through a community and they see a police car, they're going to think twice because they don't know if that guy is in the house sleep or whether he's patrolling the community. So we've we must put police officers back into the community. So the one key to getting to a safe community, we have to clean up our community because you have the broken window syndrome. <clears throat> so when you have a, a clean community, the likelihood of that community being safe goes up exponentially. So we're gonna clean up our streets and we're gonna have a safe community because we're gonna put the appropriate number of police officers on the street. So the city is <clears throat> geographically fragmented across seven districts, right? So what would you do for this city to feel as one whole? What activities or actions would you do to, for this fragmented city, because it's through the annexation, what would you do to make it feel whole? Well, first of all, uh, the beauty of our city is its diversity. We have suburban, rural, and we have uh, urban. So we have all of these different types of communities. And people don't want to see that change. They moved out into Deep South Fulton because they like the large property opportunities. People who live in the more urbanized community, they like small lots. And we're not going to superimpose our will to turn a rural community into an urban community. But what we have to do, we have to make sure that we have uh, programs and opportunities where, number one, <clears throat> before programs, we gotta make sure we are completely transparent as a community. Because people in some communities, they don't feel connected. And let me just take even a step back. The people in South Fulton, what was unincorporated, we've always felt for a long time a disconnect with our government. And that was one of the key reasons that I wanted to see this day come, bringing the government closer to the people. We've had, up until now, we've had people who are representing us and providing governance uh, far away on the northern side of Fulton County. Now everybody's here, so that's gonna automatically bring the people closer to the government. So from the city council, the mayor and city council, each one of those city council people will have a responsibility to their community. So they'll be able to filter that information back. This is not just a mayor, mayoral thing where the mayor does it all. He worked with seven city council people, which we will have one vision ultimately, and they will carry that information out, they'll bring it back in, and we will uh, deal with the needs of each community. So it'll be one community. And what's gonna be great about this community, it's gonna be best in class, because the citizens are gonna be involved in a way that they never have before. Because until now, for the most part, we've had one uh, county commissioner representing all of these areas. Then, after the report, after redistricting, we end up having two. Now we'll have eight people representing the citizens of South Florida. So that's automatically gonna bring us a lot closer together than we've ever been. 
So that's going to be great for the community. It's going to be great for the governance of the city of South Fulton. Okay. Speaking of community, what plans do you have for creating programs and facilities through the Parks and Recreation Department? Well, first of all, our parks and rec departments have to be revitalized. When you go to Burdett Park, the place is falling apart. If you go to Welcome All Park, which was one of the, the most prolific uh, multi-use uh, facilities, it's falling on disrepair. You go to Sandtown, it's falling on disrepair. And all of these things happen on somebody's watch. So the first thing we got to do, we've got to fix our buildings back so that they'll be inviting to our young people, so that they can be centers of hope where our children can go there in after school programs, we'll be able to reach out to foundations and nonprofits so they can come in and provide after school programs that'll be unrivaled by anything and any opportunity that they've had before. We need to make sure those facilities are open um, for business and with the right type of programming. So it's gonna be, the first thing we're gonna do is turn the, the facilities around and open those doors for centers of hope. Do you feel as though the current budget that this area, Unincorporated, has been functioning under is adequate going forward? And if so, why? And if not, yes. And in addition, would you support outsourcing if it was beneficial to the city? Well, the, the current budget, as we said here, with Fulton County Special Services District, it has been woefully underfunded for 10 years. And it's not the county's fault, it's a product of the property values and the dollars that came in. So they had to make do with what they had available. And, and because of lack of additional funds, we are where we are. That's why you know, the recreation center is on disrepair because unincorporated just did not have the money to do it. Did not have the money to hire additional police officers. You know, you have uh, cabinets falling off the walls at the fire, fire stations. You have one fire, depart, fire station that doesn't even have an engine. Ten stations and nine engines. So the budget hasn't been adequate, but a new day is here. So we'll go from perhaps a, maybe a $50 million budget as an unincorporated community to over $75 million. And with this special, uh, this BLOSS money for the transportation, we're talking about nearly $100 million that we have available. So we're gonna be able to do some things that we haven't even been able to imagine before. As to your second question about outsourcing, I don't really see a great need to outsource because we have the people. Now when I say we don't have a need, I say great need. That may be some minimal need initially um, from just an administrative standpoint of view to get people, let's say for instance, day one we need finance and HR. Well, we don't have those people, okay? We, and we don't have the money. So it might, it might be a worthwhile conversation to have to bring in someone to provide HR and finance on a temporary basis until we stand the department up. And then we roll those people off. But insofar as outsourcing a city, uh, so all the city services like Sandy Springs did in 2005 and Johns Creek and Milton did in 2006. Now, I don't see that as being a course that I would want to take. What are you going to do about taxes for the seniors? Are you going to increase, <coughs> are you going to increase their taxes because of the, the additional revenues you don't need to actually run this city? Well, from a, a tax standpoint of view for our seniors, when the legislation was written, uh, it was written uh, with a rollover of whatever exemptions that were there as an unincorporated community, they would roll over to the new city, whether that's the basic homestead exemption, exemption for seniors, exemption for, for, uh, for disabled, all of those exemptions will stay in place. So the likelihood that we're going to have to raise taxes is absolutely minimal, if, if not non-existent. Millage rates have increased substantially. And you remember this, when people were saying in 2006, if you create a city, your taxes are gonna go up. Well, we didn't create a city. And our millage rate has constantly increased since 2006. In 2005, uh, our millage rate was 5.75. And every year almost, since that time, it has increased to almost $12 per thousand. The other cities that were created, Sandy Spring, Johns Creek, Milton, they haven't had any millage rate increases. Why? Because they had additional resources that they had never had before. So our seniors, as well as those who are not seniors, we don't, I don't anticipate seeing a, 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 a property tax increase. 
property tax increases are a, factor, a function of two things. Number one, the millage rate. The second thing, increase in property values. If someone goes out and plants a swimming pool in their backyard or adds on a, a different additional wing on the house, they should anticipate a property tax increase. But all things being equal, there's no need to have a property tax increase when you have money coming in. The only reason tax, tax, the tax rate increase over the years is because of a lack of funds. We, that's not our reality today. By the simple creation of the city on November 8th when people said yes, there's no need to, to have a millage rate increase or, or, or tax increase. You know Sandy Springs uh, received $10 million for trees to help them uh, skirt over the, the, the developing of the new city. Uh, so where do you see us getting our money from? Well, Sandy Springs also got $65,000 from General Assembly. Uh, well, they got the $10 million from the no, General no, Assembly. So no, what I'm saying is, where I, do you see us getting the additional monies that you do not see that we need right now that I know we will need because uh, it took place? So where do you see getting additional monies that we're going to need because you're talking about taking the police from 144 people, 149, to 200 in two years. Where do you see getting that money? Well, we have one source, if not multiple. One source is the local option sales tax dollars. Our allocation based on Georgia State, who did the feasibility study, and our tax commissioner, Dr. Arthur Ferdinand, has um, estimated that the local option sales tax allocation to the, to the new city of South Fulton is going to be north of $20 million. So you take $6 million a year out of that because it's going to take $100,000 per, per police officer. That's $6 million. You take that from uh, $20 million, I believe we can afford it to hire a few police officers, so we'll have the revenue. But other revenue opportunity, listen, I ran Fulton County's public-private housing initiative. We were spending millions of dollars a year in home funds, where we were able to fix up seniors' homes and, and uh, do a lot of things. So we have a lot of opportunities. Well, money's out there. And because we are a city that exceeds 50,000, we'll be able to tap into some of those opportunities. So we'll have money come from a lot of sources the local option sales tax is going to be the, the biggest uh, opportunity that we're going to have. That's over $20 million. And of course, that, that could fluctuate based upon uh, consumer spending across the county. Because as you know, whether you uh, spent money in Palmetto or Alpharetta, Buckhead or Bankhead, that money goes into a coffer at the Department of Revenue and then it's reallocated to the cities that are incorporated based on your population. We being now the second largest city in the county, we're going to be second in line to get the second largest share. So we're going to be in an unprecedented position to do those things that I have talked about and that you're asking about. So you think that you can go in on day one and negotiate with the other cities who are getting the money now and take that money with no problem? No, I don't think that at all. I what, just want to know. No, what, but what I do know is that our allocation is not going to come from existing cities. Our allocation comes from the county where our share went. It went to the county's general fund. So our money went uh, to the county's general fund and was spent all over the county. So. Uh, so the existing cities, they were initially concerned until they got the facts, and that's why many of those cities backed off, because they realized that we're not going to be hurting them. Our money is not coming out of their, out of their coffers. It's coming from, from the county's general they fund. they negotiate for the amount of money that they get each year? No, they, they, the they actually negotiate on it. Uh, after the, uh, the census, they do that uh, every, several years, not every year. So moving forward, we don't have to renegotiate that every year. That's a... Uh, that's a every 10 years after the census count, after redistricting, once we know the size of the city. So that's not an annual event. I got a question. In terms of uh, the charter, let's go back to that, because I know you've looked at it. What, what changes, if any, because, you know, obviously changes to the charter have to go through us as a delegation. That's right. What, um, what if any, changes would you make to our charter? Because I know if we put it together, and as we put it together, it was, it was tweaked and twisted, and, and uh, things happened because <clears throat> the people who had to vote on it at the General Assembly wanted it to be more general in nature, so to speak, to, to match up with the other cities that came on board. So if you had a chance to make changes to it, what changes would you make? 
Well, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty. I wish that we had a name today that would ultimately be the name of the city in perpetuity. I would change the name. But we you could. Have a, you have a name in mind? Uh, Bruceville. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I don't have anything in mind. But if there were a name that we all agreed upon, that this would be a great opportunity to fix that. Uh, another thing that perhaps we could do, we can the the flaws or the oversights that you guys are correcting now, we would fix those. But for the most part, I think the charter puts us in a great position to move forward. Uh, one thing that was left out, of course, the court system. So you guys are going to fix that. But I think we're in a great place. Now, over time, we will find opportunities through the baptism by fire that we need to make some changes. But today, in the Benny Crane, Benny Crane's administration, we have the tools that we need with the legislation that you, thank you very much, uh, you got passed for. So we're ready to go to work. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah I was just gonna ask. I wanted to go back, because we typically hear this buzzword, economic development, you mentioned a couple of times. Right. And so I just wanted to give you an opportunity to share with us, when you say economic development, you're not at the 50,000 um, elevation. I want to hear the 10,000 foot elevation. When you say economic development, what does that really mean? Well, what it means is we create a city of opportunities. This is going to be an inclusive city. Uh, we'll have minority business development opportunity. We'll have DBE, MBE, so people will be able to come to this table and compete for opportunities to build this city out. Now, Benny Crane, uh, I, I foresee 150 bed hospital, which will be a huge economic engine. And around that hospital, regional hospital, there are going to be all of the medical building, the ancillary services. Because if you have a hospital, you need a place to go get an open MRI. You need a lab core to get the lab work done. Doctor's offices will be around this. And you will have apothecaries. You will have a best in class restaurant, white linen tablecloth restaurants. We'll have hubs where those kinds of things happen. If you look at where hospitals, good hospitals, successful hospitals are, you have economic boom happening around it. We don't have one in our city at all. So this will be a huge opportunity and it will, it's gonna serve not only South Fulton, but we're the gateway to Douglas County. So a lot of people will be able to tap into the opportunities that's gonna be created. So not only around that, uh, I envision a town center. I don't want us to be another city whose town center is on Roosevelt Highway along the railroad tracks. I want to be able to assemble a, a, a block of land where we'll have a town center, the city hall is there with a clock tower, ancillary services around it, we can have live and work. I have a great vision that's going to bring some great Do you opportunities. have a location in mind? I have a, op absolutely I do, all over this city. We can start off with a hospital on Camp Creek Parkway somewhere beyond Publix at Princeton Lake. Because when you go from Princeton Lake all the way down to Fulton Industrial, that's an acre of, of diamonds and opportunities. That's a great place that has the look and feel already that that could happen there. Then you can look at um, other areas where outside of people's residential communities where the town center can be. I have some thoughts in mind. Uh, and I won't say where they are now, but I, we can talk, you know, sidebar about them. But yes, we have some thoughts where our town center could be. Great opportunities. I, there's a, a beautiful lake on Camp Creek Parkway. I mean, great things happen around lakes. So we, we can have economic opportunities around there. And it may even require uh, enterprise zone, a ta tax allocation district. Not that we're going to give away our, our opportunity, all our tax base, but we want to incentivize businesses to come and do business in our community. Not just the mom and pop, but we want to attract national brands. Let me ask a real quick question because I'm trying to re okay. remember what you said. The, the hospital, and mm -hmm. I agree with you, hospitals bring all kinds of uh, development. Um, and, and we need a hospital, but from a practical standpoint, uh, hospitals are being closed all over the place. Um, how would you, you know, how would you combat that? Because I think we've had what five or six hospitals right. across the state well, they're still closed. That, that have closed, and uh, because of federal right. issues. So how would you do that? How would how would you get a hospital? in our city? Well, first of all, I will come to you. I will go to the Senate and get a certificate of need. And we'll have, you know, uh, the cost to fix to that. 
when you look at the hospitals that are closing across the, uh, our state, around the country, they are not closing in emerging communities. They are closing in uh, aging communities. This is, this is so new. This is so grand. Uh, this is going to be a destination place. So our, our community is a little different than the communities where they're closing. Well, they're actually closing in, in, in large part because of the issues around Medicaid and Medicare. Mm -hmm. you know, no, no, not, no, no I, I, I wasn't talking about why, I'm talking about where. Well, but, but that's right. the where and the why kind of go together. So that's why I'm trying to, you know, again, I'm agreeing with you right. that a hospital be, would be wonderful. But as people look at this, I guess, I'd like to be able to tell them what the plan is, how you do that. I mean, I'd love to see it happen. Well, what you do, you, do you, you go to Pete Montfayette and you have a conversation with them because they're setting up their hospitals all over the place. You go to Morehouse School of Medicine, who's now gotten outside of their uh, footprint. They're doing some things. So you go to these people and you have the robust conversation about the opportunities, looking forward, you know, long-term plan. You know, yes, we have to look at what we're going to do day one, but what are we going to do day 100? So you have to have that broad vision, and this is part of the vision. Now, how we work it all out, I'm going to count on people around this table, the people around this community, um, to make sure that we're able to adequately move forward. But that's a key component to economic development. You cannot build a strong economic development plan around a new Chick-fil-A. That's not the way to get it done. I understand that, but I want to ask you, where have you been that you have now seen the hospitals close in Georgia and not understanding the cause of it. At this particular time, what piece have, could we be missing? And we're in the General Assembly. You can get, these people have certificates of needs and they're closing their hospitals. So, so what's missing to that piece? They're shutting their hospitals down all across the country. Every rural legislator is up here begging for special uh, conditions and whatnot. We just passed a bill where they can get people to donate money, they won't have to pay taxes on it. So what piece of that are you looking at is going to make it different? Because it's something missing. I'm on ways and means. I see this every year. So what piece of that are we missing? Because it's no way you'll be able to get the certificate of need of an area where you just talked about when everybody knows they need special appropriation. Well, your first question is where have I been? I've been right here. I keep my ear to the, to the track so I know exactly what's going on. But let me just assure you of this, Representative, if we don't get a certificate of need, if we don't get a hospital built in our new city, it will not be for a lack of our effort. I can assure you of that. Okay? So we're going to... You know, Southwest Hospital, we had one. See, I've been here a while, and you have too. That's right. Now, and we couldn't keep that hospital open. And, and see, again, that was not in a community that was emerging. That was a community that was in decline. You know it. It was it our community. It was our community. I understand, but it was in a residential community, unlike what I'm talking about here. So one thing that we would not do, Representative, we would not uh, repeat the, the sins or the errors of our past. We're going to talk about this. We're going to find a way to make this happen. And again, we're going to move forward with an aggressive approach. We have to have something uh, to hang our hat on that will be a magnet to attract people. Now, we can disagree on what is best, but I think we will all agree that we have to find something. Is it a Whole Foods store? Is it a new Kroger? Is it another strip club? Or is it... Now, I'm just throwing stuff. No. <laughs> don't throw nothing. Don't throw, don't throw nothing at me. That no, you know. No, that you no, know. Listen. No, 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 what I am saying about that, you know, a lot of stuff have come, has come to our community that were not magnets, but they worked quite the opposite. So we have to be very, very forward thinking. We have to be catapult thinkers to think long range. And that's just, just perhaps one opportunity. We have to identify what it is that we can make happen. And again, if a hospital doesn't come in a Ben and Crane administration, it, again, it won't be because of our lack of effort. So I was going to ask to that point, how are you going to take advantage of the busiest and most effective airport sitting close to our city? You have to, to be, benefit us. You have to be involved with Aerotropolis. You have to you have to have a strong relationship with Mayor Jack Lawrence, you know, and the City Council over in East Point. You have to connect with Clayton County. These are, and you have to connect with the City of Atlanta because these are key players who are directly impacted by those opportunities. And as you know, Representative, you know that Atlanta, 
Hartsfield-Jackson Airport is one of the only airports in this country where economic boom has not happened around the airport. Hopefully with the Aerotropolis and with a lot of activity and conversations swirling around that airport, we're going to make a difference. And that's what I like about our city. Our city, which is larger than every city south of I-20, we're going to be a substantial player. People are going to come and they're going to talk to us and they're going to listen to us. So we're going to have a seat at the table. We're going to talk about how we fit in. Because as you know, many companies have come uh, to Georgia and they got off the airplane at Hartsfield Jackson, they got in a car, and they came through our community, going to some other place to set up shop. One that comes to mind is Cancer Treatment Centers of America. They drove through South Fulton. But I stopped them in there. Yeah, I, 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 they did stop, though. I, no, they I, did, I, I, but they not, not, a package, because I wanted to go over the, the, the American Black Cardiologist. Right, exactly. That's right. what I wanted them to do. Listen, get. I get it, but the point is, they. They, they went right through. So we need more strong leadership like that. That's the point I'm making. Someone like you, uh, Representative, who's going to be a strong advocate. And I'll be a partner with you being that strong advocate to get people to stop off in South Fulton and not overlook this opportunity. I, let me ask you this. You know, one of the things, you know, we all have been talking about, one of the greatest assets that, that we have down here are, are our people. And everybody around us wants to do something in our new city. What is your thought or your plan or whatever you're gonna call it that would ensure that people who already live here get to participate in the growth and the wealth that comes with that growth so that we would be in a better position for our community to be able to pass wealth from generation to generation. You understand what I'm asking? I, I do. I got you. And, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, we need banking and and uh, I know you're in the insurance business, but we need the banking and the bonding and all these other things. How would you make sure, you know, that we would be in a position for people who actually live here, uh, benefit from the growth and the prosperity that, that we're all talking about? As I alluded to earlier, Representative, we're going to be a city of inclusion. We're going to make sure that whether you live near or far, there be opportunities for you to compete for contracts and to be included. We're going to, that's why I said we're going to have DBE, MBE opportunities. Well, so we I don't can, know if everybody knows that. Uh, minority business development, female, veterans, so people will be able to have government opportunities. I don't like to use the word government set aside, but it is what it is, but we're going to make sure we have a city of inclusion. The Atlanta airport has been a huge opportunity to make millionaires. We don't have an airport, but we're going to have an opportunity to build a city best in class over the coming years uh, that's going to rival a city that I talk about often just to our south called Peachtree City. Uh, we're going to have a great plan in place where people can get involved. Their services, their uh, manufacturing, whatever they do, they'll have the opportunity I'm, I'm, to come I'm trying, here. I'm trying to dig a little deeper into this. You know, traditionally, not, not through the fault of anybody sitting around this table, but traditionally African Americans, and this city is going to be predominantly African American, has not had access to financing and access to bonding and all the other things that you need uh, to, to, to be able to open your own businesses. So I guess I'm, I'm trying to get an understanding as to how do you change the dynamics? You know, we, how are you going to negotiate with the banks? Right. And you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. I'm I, I, I got you a, now. We have a unique situation in that we have been denied access to the traditional methods. So I want to see if you have some idea as to how we're going to open up these doors. Absolutely. You keep saying we're going to include everybody, right. but how? You're right. People have to have access to participate in one of a couple of things that they have to have to adequately participate, you have to have funds. If you don't have funds, you cannot adequately, you can't fund the project. You know, you can't buy the material. So listen, as the mayor of this city, uh, I will certainly have opportunity to talk to a number of banks because our money, nearly a hundred million dollars is going to go in somebody's bank or banks. And I believe that they have to have a, do a better job of Community Investment Act. They've got to put money back into the community. We've got to make sure that <clears throat> when our people come to 
are their banks. And I'm not saying I want them to take high risk loans because that got us in trouble with savings and loans. That got us in, in, in trouble with uh, predatory loan lending in uh, uh, all kinds of mortgages of the past decade. We want to make sure that our people have an opportunity to get the loans that they need. SBA is going to have to play a part. The banks are going to have to play a part. I want to make sure that we can get some, com some quality community banks and some credit unions to take a part. The national banks, uh, if they're going to be a part of this, we want to make sure that our people can get access to capital because that's the, that's the biggest killer, one of the biggest killers to businesses, business startups or business continuation. That's management and capital. And the banks can play a huge part in the capital acquisition and opportunity. So we're going to make sure we have those conversations to make sure the banks are a full partner in capital opportunities for businesses that want to stand up, whether it's for-profit companies or non-profit uh, corporations. We want to make sure that people have access to capital. Do you have a vision for the types of businesses that we need to attract? Uh, when I say attract, you know, the just take this community right here. In order for us to buy anything, we got to get in our car to go get it. That's right. Okay. So, and most of us would rather not, but, right. but we do. So, in terms of the types of uh, businesses that you want to attract, have, have you thought about that? Absolutely. You know, the mixture? Absolutely. Share that with you. We have to be on the forefront of technology. Google can be a huge partner here. I would like to see us being the most connected city in the region. What does that mean? That means that internet has to be everywhere all the time. And it's going to help us to have access to opportunities, whether you're internet shopping, whether you're in, doing business from home, whether even our students can have more connectivity. There's a huge digital divide that we need to close that gap. So with Google Fiber coming to town, we got to make sure that we are well connected. Wouldn't it be wonderful that no matter where you went in this city, that you have the opportunity to be fully connected? So I think technology has to be one of the key. Um, business opportunities that we want to attract because millennials are absolutely on the forefront of technology. They are high paying jobs. It's not all warehouse. Warehouses are part of technology because they have to have the components to bring to your house if that's the case. But we have to make sure technology is a huge player in this new city. That's one of the key pieces that I think is important for our long term success. Okay. If we were in another part of the country, and somebody, just, just like we're sitting here and I say New York City, something comes to mind, does it not? It does. Okay. Uh, an image of some sort. If I say Los Angeles, something comes to mind. Is that correct? Yeah, great things, yeah. Okay. So if I'm in another place and I say City of South Fulton, what, should come, what do you want to come to people's minds? Best in class. And what does that mean? That means that it's clean, it's safe, and we don't have to leave our community. We will no longer be a bedroom community in the long view of a Ben and Crane administration. Right now, we're a bedroom community. We get up every day, we get in our car, we go to another community to work, and we come back home, go to bed, start all over. I want to be able to have a city where opportunities are here, whether it's high-paying jobs, mid-level jobs, and those on the lower end of the totem pole. So I want it to be a destination. Now, it won't be, you know, um, perhaps it won't be a Broadway place, but, but you see the trend in Georgia. This is the Hollywood of the East. Um, there are a lot of studios coming around us. I don't want to oversaturate with, with studios because we'll end up like we ended up on 138 with a ton of auto dealerships. When the market crashed, that place uh, suffered greatly. But right now, I will want us to be known as the best in class city, one that's clean, one that's safe, and we have a lot going on, whether that's daytime or nighttime activity. We want to have great opportunities all the time for our people. Well, we don't necessarily have to leave town to get a quality pair of shoes, a nice suit, okay, and a restaurant with white linen tablecloths. Can you go a couple steps deeper? And here's the reason why I say it, because you mentioned three or four times about changing the name, which, you know, I'm not saying I'm for or against, but... Right. So it sounds like you do have a, a deeper brand on why you continue to mention changing the name. So I just wanted to tag on, what does that, what image really comes to mind, whatever the name is, 
because it's going to be more than just best in class, right? right? Because you're competing with other cities that would say, hey, Benny, we're best in class. So what really is that? Well, description? As, as it relates to the name, changing the name in a Benny Crane administration is not the highest priority. I've crisscrossed this, this city left to right, top to bottom. And people are saying the highest priority is to clean our streets and make them safe again. So once we take care of the priority things, we'll deal with the name. I don't have a fixation on changing the name. Now here's what I'm hearing about the current name. Fulton is named after someone about a dark past. Don't want to, to the extent that that's true, maybe we want to move away from that. But when we started this process, the name was important to leave as South Fulton because everybody, no matter where you live, whether you live in Sandtown or Cliftondale or wherever, we all called ourselves South Fulton. So for me, there's no urgency. There's an urgency for some people to change the name. But for me, I got to make sure I set high priorities. But insofar as the, the big picture branding, you know, we, we have to get to work, do the heavy lifting, and that will emerge. I promise you that before New York had, you know, Broadway, they didn't have Broadway. So they weren't known for Broadway. Hollywood hasn't always been known for its great studios because before they had studios, they didn't have studios. But as things developed, a brand emerged. So we'll work to be best in class. Now we'll have to compete for that because there's a best in class city somewhere now. But I promise you this, we're gonna put pressure on them because that's gonna be our goal every day that we get up to be a best in class city. And how we know uh, what's best in class, we're gonna go and talk to those people. We'll see where they say they're best in class see what they're doing, and we're gonna copy some of those things too. So we're gonna set out to stand up a great city, and from that will emerge a brand. Okay. Okay. In detail, tell me, what have you changed to include women in your next administration? Well, that's a good question. The person that runs my campaign is a woman, to start with. Is that a change? Because I've known you for a while, so is that a change? I've never, I've, I have run for public office a couple of times, okay, as you know, uh, but well beyond running for campaign because that's just spots on my resume, things I've done. I've done a lot more than run for campaigns. I've not run for more than I've run. I've never had a female at the top of my administration, of my campaign. So what have you changed? So, so what have I changed? Well, that's, that's a change to start with. Uh, I have always been inclusive. Uh, I've never had anything outside of my character and the way I do business that would exclude anybody, whether that's men or women, lesbian, gay, straight, whatever. Uh, they work for me. They work with me. So a lot of things I don't have to change, Representative. I just continue some of the things that I've done because I am very proud of my record of inclusion working with people of all stripes, Republican, Democrats, independents, males, females. That's my, that's my body of work. I'm very proud of it. So I don't have to change in that regard. Okay, that's, uh, if there's any last questions, do you, you have any? No. Okay. <coughs> you have? Do you feel as though this position is part-time on day one and if you feel as though it's part-time or, or full-time, are you available? Do you have the availability to dedicate yourself to make this city the best in class, as you said? If anybody feels standing up a city of this size is a part-time position, uh, they are woefully wrong and it's, it lacks deep thought. Absolutely, this is gonna be a full-time job, standing this city up, because you gotta keep your shoulder to the wheel every day, all day. Do I have the time? I make the time. Uh, I have the financial resources that um, I can make sure I, I'm self-funded. I don't have to rely on, you know, um, the income coming from the, from the city. Uh, I'm doing pretty, pretty well, I'm okay. Uh, but insofar as my time allocation to run this city, to do what I need to do, I'm there. Now one thing that we have to be very, very clear about though, that the day-to-day administration of this city is not a strong mayor form of government. It's a weak mayor form of government. So we're going to have a best in class city manager to take care of the day to day. And he's going to uh, make sure he has or she has great department heads. So 
it won't be Benny Crane out there running, de running departments, uh, but in so forth doing the thing that a mayor needs to do to make sure we get all the pieces moving in sequence. I'll be there every day that I need to be there, won't miss a meeting, I'll be there. It's a full-time position. I don't want to just make a short answer long, but I'm well prepared to make this a full-time job, even though it's part-time pay. Last question. <clears throat> I'm sure that when you came in, you didn't know what questions we were going to ask. I didn't. But, but the, uh, and you probably were hoping that we were going to ask at least one question that would allow you to get it all out that you want to get out. <laughs> what was that question? Hmm. That's the toughest question that you've asked me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say this. Here's a question that people have been raising and a concern that people have been raising. They said, a new city should have someone as its first mayor, someone with the elected experience. And my response to that concern that people have that the first mayor ought to have some experience in being elected, my response is simply this. Sandy Springs, Johns Creek, Milton, Brookhaven, Peachtree Corners, Dunwoody, Chat Hills, I can go on and on. None of those cities, when they stood up over the years, over the past 11 years, not one of those cities has a mayor that had any elected experience when they started those cities. Okay, but what's the question? The question is, do I feel that um, the first mayor ought to have elected experience? And I say the answer is unequivocally no. Unequivocally no. Uh, that's not a prerequisite to assure that we can have a high quality uh, mayor and a best in class city. Okay. Any other questions? Well, good. Well, Benny, we appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to us, and uh, we look forward to, to see how this comes out. It's going to be interesting. It is already interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, Benny. Okay, for sure. We're going to go over here and see how this comes out. It's going to be interesting. It is already interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. Appreciate it. Okay, for sure.